Good morning, church. Whether you are in person uh, in the church parking lot or you are joining us live streaming or uh, watching the recorded sermons uh, and the worship, uh, we just want to welcome you to the worship today. It is a warm day, so you can choose to sit in your car, by your car. Um, there, there are still rooms in the courtyard that you can consider to go, and you can also consider to go to the breezeway or the uh, uh, atrium, the foyer area, and that might be cooler there, or you can find any shades that will make you comfortable as we go through the message today. Because this morning, we're going to ask this question, can a Christian take his brother, can a brother take another brother to a secular court to settle a grievance? And Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, says no, no. And he shows us a better way to settle grievances. And so with that, let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. And you can turn to your digital Bible or your you know, printed Bible and follow along. And that will give us a backdrop of the preaching today. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. It says, when one of you has a grievance against brother, does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters per pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to shame, to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual, sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know, before I go into the exposition of God's Word, I just want to set the perimeter of today's sermon. First of all, this is not talking about criminal cases. It is a civil case. In fact, it is a minor case. Secondly, it is a dispute between two Christian brothers. So the passage here doesn't address nor prohibit lawsuits with non-Christians or secular corporations, even though the same principle can apply. You don't have to go that route. You can use it as a last resort, but it doesn't address nor prohibit lawsuits with non-Christians and secular corporations. Thirdly, Christians need the secular court to decide on cases that go beyond the church jurisdictions and many, many areas that the church are not expertise in those areas. And Paul himself, has been respectful of the legal system of the days, even though he discouraged the two brothers not to take that route. He was respectful of the legal system, and he was not hesitant to use it to exercise his rights as a Roman citizen and defend the legitimacy of the gospel. And number four, I want to say that I'm a pastor. I'm not a legal profession. So when I use terminologies in the legal uh, realm, uh, I, I am not as accurate. I am not as precise. But today, you are not listening to a law school class. Today, you are listening to a teaching on how a healthy church resolves grievances biblically. So with that, I want to point you to the point number one, a foolish way. There is a foolish way. Verse 1 says, When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? You know, Paul uses nine questions to provoke their thinking about not taking that route. In fact, three times in those questions, he asks, Do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? Assuming that you know the answer, but you are not following 
what you have already known in your understanding of the right way to do. And in the whole original sentence, the word dare, how dare, does he dare, is placed in the first word of the whole sentence. The whole idea is how dare you do that? You know better. And how, how foolish of you is the implication. So that's how I came with the first point is there is a foolish way. Don't take that route. Apparently, in the church of Corinth, there's a brother A who defrauded brother B. So brother B took brother A to court to redress his grievance. What is the nature of his grievance? We can get a hint. The Bible didn't say specifically, but we can get a hint in verse 8. Uh, in verse 8, he says, But you yourself, when Paul addressed brother A, you yourself wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So what is the nature of that? What do you mean by wrong? It means to treat someone unjustly. What do you mean by defraud? It means to steal, to take away something. Uh, so probably, if that is the right words and the right case, probably it was a case of property division or a, a business dealing that went sour, or disputes in contracts, in the fine prints of the contracts, or disagreement in profit sharing because they were business partners. And if that is the case, then most likely this is among the well-to-do in the church, uh, even leaders, because during those days, few people have ownership of anything, property or business. And he says, why are you taking it to the unrighteous and not taking it to the saints? There's a comparison of Christians and non-Christians. The unrighteous are the non-Christians. The saints are the Christians. So what is Paul's point? Paul's point is, if dispute requires intervention, it should occur within the Christian community. Uh, why, why so? And, and how so? So in verses 2 to 11, that's the second point. Paul begins to address how and why. Because there is a better way. There is a better way. A Christian way. A biblical way. First of all, he addressed the why. Why shouldn't we take that route? Because of where we stand in Christ. Our standing in Christ. Verse 2 says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? And verse 3 says, Do you not know? that we are to judge angels and how much more than matter pertaining to this life. So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? This is where we stand in Christ, Paul says. Christians, we will judge the world, the unbelieving world, and the fallen angels together with Christ in His glory. Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus said to the apostles, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's everybody. That's the unbelieving Jews in the nation of Israel. You will judge with me. Jesus said to the disciples. How does it happen? How does it really work? We don't know, but that's a teaching of Christ to the apostles. Secondly, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, about the fallen angels, Peter says this, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Peter says something about the fallen angels and how they were kept in hell waiting to be judged. So apparently Christians will not only judge the 12 tribes of Israel and all those who are unbelieving, but also the fallen angels. And since, since Christians will help Jesus to judge unbelieving world and fallen angels, Paul follow up with two questions. First of all, are you incompetent? to try trivial cases. 
Well, Paul was not saying that that brother who was defrauded, that his case uh, well, is not important. He was saying that compared to the judgment day, compared to the judgment about the eternal state, eternal destiny of a person, the human litigation that you are involved in is really a trivial matter and that will fade away in eternity, right? And then he followed up with another question. He said, since we can judge the fallen angel, how much more we can judge matters pertaining to this life? Because eternal matter is much more important than earthly matters, right? And you invite those with no standing in the church to be your judge? What do you mean by that? Who is he pointing to? The, those who have no standing in the church? Well, of course, he was mentioning about these two brothers who went before the court to the legal system. Why did he say they have no standing in the church? Uh, there are two explanations. One, because the court of those days were corrupt and they were despised by everybody. All the Corinthians, including those Christians in the church in Corinth, so they were considered as no standing, despised by people. But more likely, I think the second explanation is closer to Paul's heart because Paul has great respect for the legal system. I think he meant that because the legal system has no relations to the church. They do not understand Christians have this body life together that we belong to Christ together in the same body. They don't understand our high view of God and Scripture. They don't understand the teaching on the Sermon of the Mount, our values, our relationships. So when you invite them to pass judgments on the grievances that these two brothers are experiencing, they will not be able to give a fair or full judgment. They may serve the legal purpose, but they may not be able to serve the Christian purpose. And it is in that light that Paul says, remember where we stand in Christ. We will judge the fallen angels. We will judge the unbelieving world together with Christ. So don't take it to the world. But he reminds them in the second point is, then how do we do that? Right In verses 5 to 11. How do we do that? First of all, he says by mediation. By mediation. Verses 5 and 6. He says, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brothers go to the law against brothers and that before unbelievers. Paul says, I felt so awkward. I felt so ashamed of what you are doing. And you should feel that way. You know, obsessive shame is bad. It gives you unnecessarily guilt. But a right dosage does awaken our conscience to bring repentance. And that's the purpose of Paul, to bring them to repentance. He says, don't you have someone wise enough within you who can mediate your differences instead of going to the court? This is about an individual in the congregation who is wise and maybe that person has some legal knowledge as well to mediate the dispute. You know, in the church, we have people who have different walks of life, and there's a lot of wisdom uh, in, in this area. Uh, those with professional trainings, and Christians who have been through life, they have settled many disputes in the duration of their work life and their life. They walk with God. They know the church life. They are trustworthy. There is a track record. They are trained in biblical teaching. They know God's word. And, and some maybe even human resource experts and et cetera, et cetera in the church. Why not gather this pool of resource and wisdom to help you to mitigate your differences? So when these two brothers come before the court, it is the failure of the two individuals, but it is also a failure of the church to be the church. That's what Paul is reminding people. Bring together for mediation under the wisdom of experience one. And secondly, by settlement. 
not only mediation, but by settlement. Look at verses 7 and 8. He says, to have lawsuit at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourself wrong and defraud even your own brothers. And here, Paul is exhorting these true brothers, drop the case, drop the lawsuit, negotiate the terms of agreement, and bring it to a closure, because a lot is at stake. First of all, he addressed the, the plaintiff, the brother B, who were defrauded and brought brother A to the court. He addressed him. He said, why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? And why do you take it to, to, the, to the court and do that? And he is reflecting the teaching of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, when Peter says Jesus, when he was reviled, that Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, when Jesus suffered, he did not threaten, but continue entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He entrusted himself to God the Father to judge justly. And this is also the reflection of Jesus' teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. You walk the second mile. Do not retaliate when strike. Trust God to be the judge of the final justice for you. See, Paul's point is, it is even better, brother, to accept being wrong than to demand recompense, recompense, in either a secular or a Christian context. Why not rather be wrong? You know why? Because a lot is at stake. Because it is already a defeat, he reminded the brother. It is already a defeat. It is not only just a defeat for you too. It is a defeat. A lot is at stake. It is a defeat to the Christian witness. It is a defeat to the Lord's name. It is a defeat to the church reputation. It is a, dispeat, a, a, dispeat, uh, a defeat to the gospel of Jesus Christ. A lot is at stake because the secular court is usually in the marketplace, in an open trial. Everybody is watching that. So for the sake of all these things, don't take that route. People remember, if you insist on litigation for whatever things, it is usually a path of no return until you drop the case. And you can't talk to each other. It has to go through the attorneys or in the presence of the attorneys. It is all about evidence. It is all about winning the case, receive maximum compensation. And in the midst of all that, the Christian values and teachings are lost in the pursuit of litigation. A lot is at stake. Paul addressed the brother B who brought the case to the court. But what about him? You can almost hear Brother B say, what about him? It is so unfair. What about my loss? In verse 8, Paul begins to address Brother A, who defrauded Brother B, and say, but you yourself wrong and defraud even your own brothers? Your behavior is not acceptable in the church. You need to repent. And with that, he brought a very clear address to these two brothers and said, drop the case, settle. What happens is if you do not drop the case and continue to let it ferment, the, 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 the emotions spread to other people and people begin to take sight and rally others and we begin to have confrontation in the community. A lot is at stake. But brothers and sisters, it is so easy to talk about mediation. <laughs> it is so easy to talk about let's settle, right? But you know better and I know better that coming together for mediation and coming together for settlement, it's so hard. It is so hard because your ego, your loss, your sense of injustice is at its peak. And how do you cool down and willing to come together. You know, in my years of ministry, I have known betrayal. I've been stabbed in the back, and I have consulted attorney to prepare myself for possible litigation against the community I led. I thank God it did not proceed 
before a secular court, but it was hard. It was hard. And whether mediation or settlement, you know, we need one more thing to help us to be willing to come together. And that will be the third avenue by submission to Christ. Submitting to Christ. Verses 9 and 10. Look at verses 9 and 10 as Paul continues to address Brother A who defrauded another person. Okay, he said, Brother A, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? In fact, he said it two times. After he listed the nine vices that will not inherit the kingdom of God, he said it again two times. What you're doing is wrong and you need to repent. This is not right. You need to make it right by coming before the Lord to settle, to mediate, and to ask for forgiveness. That's Paul's point when he addressed Brother A again. And he listed nine, nine vices, very much like chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. Now he added a few more in this new list. Why do we put list? To be specific that I'm not talking about general points. I'm not saying something in a blanket statement. I'm saying things specifically and say, this are wrong. Don't do it. This is not consistent with the Christian teaching. And he says, these are the things that will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, sexually immoral. It means promiscuous sexual activities. Idolaters. Worshipping human-made gods. Adulterers. Sex outside of marriage. Men who practice homosexuality. Gay sex, thieves, taking things without permission. Greedy, it means skimming to get more and more. Drunkards, it means intoxicated by alcohol. Revilers, it means using abusive language. Swindlers, it means stealing by force, forcefully taking things for your own benefits. He said, these were the things that will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he put all these things before Brother A and said, repent. You know, even as we read the list, you look at the nine sins mentioned by Paul. There are certain ones that you may feel more disgusted by or you feel like this is so bad, this is worse. But remember, when Paul listed these nine things, he put them on equal footing, that they are all bad. Don't even think that because I'm only a swindler and I am not an adulterer, so I'm slightly better. They are all bad. Because he said, all those things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the good news is in verse 9, uh, in verse 11, he says, and such were some of you. This is not about pulling sins and vices and listed them from the air. These are real cases in the church of Corinth. He says, such were some of you. That Corinthian church members were engaged in those sinful behaviors, but now, but now they are transformed by Jesus and they have forsaken those lifestyles. And it is so important to see that, but, but, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Because in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, you were washed, which means forgiveness of sins. You were washed by the blood of Jesus that you follow up with baptism, another physical presence and physical clarity of washing, but it begins from the heart. And you were sanctified, means you are a new creation in Christ Sin no more. You are set apart to be used by God, to be His witness. That's what is sanctification. You are used by God and you serve God's purpose and agenda. And you were justified through Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross that our sins are forgiven and we are reconciled with the Father, God the Father. And we are justified by faith alone, in Jesus alone, through grace alone. And because of that, two brothers, don't take it to the court. Drop the case. Come before 
men of wisdom because we are brothers in Christ. We are washed, sanctified, and justified because we shall judge the world and fallen angels with Christ. That's our standing. Because we operate in Christian values. Because we submit to God's word. There is no place to settle our differences except the wise in the church who are filled by the Holy Spirit. And Paul's point is, it is even better to accept being wrong than to demand recompense in either a secular or a Christian context. That's why. That's why. So as I conclude the message today, I want to remind you and myself that the way Christian settles our disputes is a reflection of our new identity in Jesus. This new identity determines how we treat each other and what avenue should we choose to handle our disputes, to mitigate our disputes. You see, the Jews can choose the Sanhedrins, which is a body of elders, and arbitrate the matters among the Jewish people. The Romans have the law of the courts, and they can abjurate disputes, and they are backed by the threat of force. And when the church adopts the authoritative methods of the Sanhedrins or the Romans magistrates to resolve disputes, this focus of arbitration and judgment and winning and losing will corrode our community and our solidarity in the church. So Paul articulates a better way to settle grievances based in love and points us towards a new goal that transcends winning and losing, namely, to grow into the body of Christ, to be God's people, to reflect our new identity in Christ as children of God. That's the way that Paul is recommending to us today. In my applications, I'm going to share four thoughts with you. First of all, do not underestimate the power of Christian community. Do not underestimate underestimate that. This Christian community has corporate wisdoms from many saints who walk with Jesus for many, many years. They have wisdom. Do not under, underestimate the collective wisdom of the church community of Jesus Christ. And we will be willing to submit to them and come under them for clarity of what is right and what is wrong and what is the best way to move forward together. So do not underestimate the power of Christian community. Secondly, I'm going to give you an advice. Whenever there is grievances, early intervention is always preferred. I know some of us do not like to have confrontation. I know Asian cultures probably play a part in discouraging people for telling uh, as upfront as they should be. But when we deal with grievances and conflicts, early intervention is always preferred. You know, sometimes in the church community, everybody knows what's happening, but we just pretend we don't know. And nobody wants to address that. This is called open secret. And we have open secrets all the time, unfortunately. It is always preferred to deal with it as early as possible when memories are still clear, when we still know the matters, when we still can analyze the things. If you let it ferment, we don't remember who says what and when was the context and how did it happen. And it becomes so complex that it is not possible to resolve without hurting some individual or others. So early intervention is always preferred. Thirdly, I want to give a reminder to the church that sometimes in our church, we have members who come together uh, for business dealing. Uh, they come together as business partners to start a new business, and that's wonderful. Or sometimes they hire a business of a brother uh, for a certain service and pay that brother, and that's wonderful. But I just want to remind you that when you do that, be as specific as possible. Be as clear as possible and follow up with legal documents 
if you have a long-term partnership and long-term relationships. And sometimes because we are members of the same church, sometimes because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we feel like, oh, I can trust you and you can trust me. Sure, we will love to respect each other and trust each other. But when you deal with business uh, partnership or hiring of someone doing something for you, and along the way, if there is no clarity, then the fine line is blurred. And we begin to speculate, we begin to to uh, maybe even accuse each other of, I thought you said that. No, I didn't mean it that way, but you said that. And then disputes, grievances begins to ferment, and it gets worse, it gets bad. So be clear, be specific, be legal. And sometimes those legal documents are so helpful to help us to be clear in what we said and what we intend for this to go forward together. So that's my reminder. And finally, I want to say that the principle we apply to not today, that the identity we have, the new identity we have in Christ, that we are washed, we are sanctified, we are justified. The same principle can be applied in the current political unrest in anticipation of the inauguration of the new president. Wherever you stand in the political side, Whatever, whatever is your agenda and, and whatever actions you choose to respond to the inauguration of the new president. As a Christian, I want to remind you, the same principle applied, that you are washed, that you are sanctified, that you are justified, and with that new identity, you conduct yourself, you carry yourself in speech and in actions for the glory of God. And that's how you and I should respond. And in the next four years, it could be a challenge for us as a church, a conservative church, that there are agendas that are coming our way that can challenge us, confront us, that we don't like, and we find it so, so, so the un- inability to even fight back. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. It is our new identity in Christ that we are washed, we are sanctified, we are justified. That will determine how our church should stand in the biblical principle and how we respond to opponents, to people who disagree with our stand and our position. And that's where we stand. The same principle applied. So I want to advise you, brothers and sisters, choose the better way. Choose the better way. Let us pray. Lord, we want to thank you for the teaching. Lord, we were not there at the church of Corinth. We don't know how bad it was, and we don't know how exactly that happened, but we are thankful for the principle of reminding us that the new identity we have in Christ is the guiding principle for us to respond and to make decisions in order to glorify the Lord, because a lot is at stake. A lot is at stake. Teach us to stand firm in your word and by your mercy to press on, to continue to be your witness in this community and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.